Okay, I'm going to talk about open source routing with OpenBSD. Who am I? Um, I my name is Sebastian Benoit. Um, I have been working as a sysadmin and later network admin since 1998 about. And I have known and used various BSD systems since back then. Um, mostly FreeBSD, but at one point in my life I actually ran NetBSD on my notebook because it was the only one, uh, only system that could suspend. That was in 2000 or so. <laughs> so um, today uh, my, my job is in Germany and at a hosting provider. So we're doing managed hosting and a larger part of our network uses OpenBSD. Um, yeah, uh, what I want to do in this talk is present the, wh what we currently have in OpenBSD, the routing demons that are there, and the way you can plug them together, the way how they work together, and how you can use that to improve your network. Um, and some, some other things you might want to think about if you go that way and start using that. Okay, uh, who here um, is actually already using OpenBSD in that role? Okay, quite a few people. This side of the room, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you over there. Who is uh, using? Who is actually running their own network, uh, bigger network, here? Well, okay, who, who, who knows how BGP works, how OSPF works? Okay, well, not everyone, so, <laughs> not everyone, not everyone, so that's good, because uh, quite a bit is introduction into, um, yeah, how, how rout routing works and why you need it. So uh, here's an example network. Let's say this, this is um, your, your sphere of influence that you want to uh, work on. And yeah, put laptops there. I couldn't find a better icon. <laughs> put tablets there, I don't care. Um, so you have some place in, in your company where you have a few servers and you have some other places where you have machines there that could be different offices, that could be in the same house, but you have them separated in your network. And obviously they have to be connected to these servers down there. Um, yeah, and now, if you put, do that with static routing, you at some um, at some point you will um, you will find out that if one link goes down, um, everything else doesn't work anymore because uh, there is only one static route, and uh, yeah, if that's not usable, it doesn't work anymore. So you might want to say, okay, I have these th three links, and if this this one is broken, well, why not use these here? And that's what you need a routing protocol for that discovers these paths for you and does that. Okay, the next step uh, is that you want to connect your network to some, someone else, this company B over here, and this company B is possibly your ISP. Um, and yeah, you, uh, now, now you have a path between different companies here that you want to use and do routing over. And this company over, over there, company B, needs to know what network you're using here, and you need to know what networks are available over here to send traffic there. Okay, um, a few words that you find in literature um, that if you don't know anything about the subject might be a bit uh, irritating at first. Um, on a hardware router, you separate the hardware and the software on the machine, and uh, these two things are called management plane and forwarding plane. The forwarding plane is basically what moves your packets around, and the management plane is what tells the hardware what to do with those packets, where to send them. Um, 
These two go along with two other words, the RIB, the routing information base, and the FIB, the forwarding information base. And on a software router, like on OpenBSD, we have a similar uh, place where we have this cut. We have the routing table in the kernel, and the kernel is doing all the forwarding of the IP packets. And we have a couple of pieces of software up there that talk to the kernel through a thing that's called the routing socket. And they're basically the same, same um, categories. OK. Um, now, to do what we want to do, there are a few routing protocols that are available. These are a few of the common ones. Um, there are a few more that I didn't list um, uh, for various reasons. Um, there is one called OSPF, Open Shortest Path First. Uh, that's quite important. Um, and then there is ISIS, Intermediate System to Intermediate System. That uh, These both are used inside your local network, usually. Um, then there is BGP. BGP is a protocol that runs most of the internet. So uh, all the ISPs are connected to one another with BGP. Um, and this is what transports, yeah, what, what uh, transports the routing information all over the world. Then there are two others, RIP, which is one of the oldest routing protocols. Uh, anyone here using RIP? Who has used it? at one point. Oh, a lot. Uh, only in class somewhere? <laughs> OK, that doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, not the old one. <laughs> OK, only in class, OK. <laughs> OK, once. Yeah, that's that's right. Sometimes in, in hardware machines, you need extra licenses for the better protocols, so you only have RIP. <laughs> uh, I used it in the 90s on a on a Sun Spark station, actually. Um, yeah, and there is something called IGRP uh, and the newer EIGRP, which uh, are Cisco protocols. Uh, and yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I mentioned that later on that, um, yeah. OK, and um, in OpenBSD, you will find these, these ones marked in red. Um, we have those. We don't have ISIS, so if anyone here uh, wants to try to implement that. <laughs> Why? Why not? It's something we don't have, and you can do it. And it's actually might be better than OSPF in some areas. OK. Now, OSPF. Uh, there are two versions, um, one for IPv4 and version 3 for IPv6. Um, in, um, in OpenBSD, you will find uh, two daemons to do that, um, OSPFD and OSPF60. Uh, but both the configuration is pretty much the same, so I'm not showing both here. Um, the way they work is uh, you tell, you do the, use the configuration to tell them to run on certain interfaces, and they start announcing that they're, they, they exist on these interfaces over multicast. So any other OSPF speaker on that interface will see, see your router and uh, will exchange information with them. Um, so they learn about their neighbors, and um, that way they build an internal database, a, a map of the network, and know which neighbor is connected to with, with which other neighbor. And then on this on this map, you can run Dijkstra's algorithm. Each of the B, uh, OSPF speakers will do that, and will draw a map of the whole network with the shortest path to any other neighbor. And then you know the when you know which networks are connected to which of the OSPF speakers, and you basically get your routing information base. Yeah. So uh, if you look uh, with OSPF CTL show neighbor, 
at uh, this neighbor information. You will get a table that shows your, your neighbors here with their router ID, uh, state, how long they've been, they, they are up, and on which interface they are seen there. Okay. Um, all our routing demons in, um, will, will have a syntax uh, tool like this, OSPF CTL, BGB CTL, and that's how you control them, basically. And the syntax that you have here um, to, to, yeah, uh, to, to give them uh, commands is roughly based on other implementations you find out there. So if you're somehow used to, uh, to some other router, you will find your way, I guess. Okay, so now we have this, uh, this network diagram again, and I put in some IP addresses. Now this, this all is uh, taking place in this slash 23 network, and we have part of that, a 24 down here, and a little 28 here, and a little 26 here, and these are connected with uh, slash 30 networks. Um, yeah, and if you are on this machine here and run OSPF CTL show rip, you get your routing information base, and it's actually too long for the screen, which is a bit sad, but it doesn't matter all that much. Um, okay, so you, you have uh, a slash 30 here and a slash 30 here, and that is actually this, this network in between those routers. And you have that twice because you see it once behind this machine and once behind this next hop here. Um, and down here, what you don't see is the block for, for this slash 24, which should be in that table as well. Okay. Um, and the configuration you need to do to run OSPF there is really pretty simple. It's uh, it's you define your router ID. Every, every speaker has to have its uh, own uh, router ID. And you, uh, in OSPF, you have something called an area. You usually have at least the zero area. And um, yeah, then you give a, give, uh, tell it on which interfaces to run. And um, then in this case here, you have one interface that's passive, which means it doesn't speak uh, multicast on that interface, but it will notice that this, uh, um, the network behind IX2 is there and will announce to the rest of the network that it knows how to transport traffic for this network. Okay, and then we have one line here to say, I also want to tell the rest of the world that uh, I am announcing a default route. Um, in some cases, you want to do that, and uh, yeah, in OSPF to uh, announce a um, prefix over the network, you have to have it in your routing table, in your FIB. So you have to add it, for example, like this here. Um, this one is already there because um, it's configured on IX2. So the 192.0.3 slash 24 is already there, okay. Um, now with BGP, um, BGP is a whole different thing. Um, it works differently, um, and it's using TCP. Hmm? Oh, I thought you were saying something. Okay. Um, in in BGP, you have something called an AS number, and an AS number identifies an, uh, an entity, for example, an ISP, um, and all the BGP routers in, in this network use the same AS number. Um, and when, when different ASs talk to each other, they, uh, over TCP, they, uh, the BGP routers called BGP peers, Usually, they uh, transmit the prefixes that they know about and that they uh, are capable to send traffic to. Um, and each of these prefixes is accompanied by, um, by an AS path. And this AS path describes the list of ASs that 
are traversed when traffic flows through along along this route. Um, and in the end, what what decides which uh, route to use is, uh, for example, the AS path length. So um, that's why this is called a distance vector protocol because each of the vectors, each prefix has a, uh, a path that describes the distance to this destination over this path. Um, and obviously one decision on which to base your routing decision is uh, one, one fact uh, is the path length. Because you can assume that the path length is somehow related to the amount, uh, the, the time it takes to get traffic there. Um, but as we'll see, there are other ways to, to influence this routing decision. Um, inside your AS, all your BGP speakers are connected to all other BGP speakers, usually. Um, okay. Now, s telling another um, peer that you have a network, uh, that you know how to route traffic to a network, is called an announcement. Um, so if you, um, if, if you have the example network here, you announce to other speakers that you have this slash 23 network. Um, what, what you announce uh, to, to other ASs is a matter of policy. And that's why BGP is used uh, on the global internet because you need, uh, you need this policy to manage the way traffic flows. And BGP uh, allows you to, to apply a lot of policy to your routing decisions. So, um, for ex the, 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 the standard policies you, you can have is you, uh, or types of networks you typically see are the ones that announce only their own prefixes that are at the end of a chain. Um, then you have ASs that announce to someone else their own and their customer prefixes. And then you have um, ASs that um, provide internet uh, connectivity uh, and they typically give you the whole view of the internet, um, which is at the moment somewhere around 550,000 routes um, in IPv4. In IPv6, it's around 25 or 26,000. Yeah, 26,000, I think. Um, yeah, if you tell a neighbor that you have a prefix, that means that neighbor possibly sends traffic your way over, over this link. Um, and if you have different links, you can use your policy to influence which um, paths are taken. Um, and this is also a policy decision. You want to optimize your paths for reachability or for cost or for bandwidth usage on those links. So again, the example with the network over here. And you connect over a link. And you, this, this network now has an AS number up here. And this one has an AS number. And it sends over here that it has this slash 23 and AS 65537 now can send traffic this way. Uh, and the configuration in our BGPD looks like this. Everyone needs to know their AS number. This one means I'm, I, I am able to announce this slash this 23 network. And you define a neighbor. The neighbor is given by the IP address. Uh, and you also have to tell him that it has this AS number. Um, yeah, and in the end, you tell him to allow this prefix to be sent to any, uh, including this neighbor, of course. So um, on the other side, it's just the opposite. Um, you establish the TCP connection between the two with this block, and you uh, allow to accept the prefix back here, the slash 23, from this guy here. Uh, and that's wrong. There should be a two there. <laughs> OK. Um, Yeah, uh, again, we use BGP CTL in this case to look at what's going on. And this command here is run on this machine. And um, 
it shows rip out, which is the outgoing um, routing information to this neighbor. And we see we are announcing our slash 23 here. Um, and on this side, over, over here, we look at the routing information base and we see that this slash 23 we uh, get and the next hop to send our traffic to uh, is the 202 here. Um, and in the, at the end here, there is the AS path and in this case it is of course only one AS there, namely the one that originates it. Okay. Uh, in the other direction, we are receiving routes. Um, uh, pretty much the same picture. Uh, we want to influence the, what we receive to, because when we receive a route over BGP, that means we send traffic out over that link and we want to optimize our routing decision for certain um, situations. Like for example, uh, one link is near capacity, so we want to shift traffic over to another one, or um, yeah, one link costs more money if we're over a certain bandwidth commitment, and we want to stay below that, so we're shifting traffic. Um, or maybe we're in the lucky situation that we don't have to do any of those decisions, then we let the algorithm in BGP do its own thing and it will decide on such things as the AS path. Length. Um, yeah, down here we see a few of the filter rules that we can apply on, on those routes we get. And for example, we can set something called the local pref where the default value is 100 and um, in this case we tell the router to um, have a higher local pref which makes sure that we will use this route from this neighbor if it is available. If it's not available, the next best one will be chosen. Um, and down here we have an, an other rule that says, for example, deny uh, any prefix with a, a prefix length lower or equal seven, which means uh, we don't want anyone to send us a prefix larger than a slash eight, because nowhere on the internet there should be a prefix like that except the default route, if we get one. But usually, if we want to get the whole internet routing table, we exclude the default route. Okay. Oh yeah, that one, uh, for example, uh, influences what we, um, what, what the, th this manipulates the next hop when we pass the route on to other BGP peers. Yes, we uh, when when the um, we apply it when the route comes in, um, uh, but uh, in the rib we will put the next uh, hop. It's 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 working that way. <laughs> so yeah. Okay. Um, our example here. We have um, uh, our, our networks that we had previously, and now we connect to AS250 up here, and AS250 gives us transit to the whole of the internet by uh, sending all routes it has down here, and uh, AS65537 passes all of them on over here. Um, and now, uh, when we are on this machine and run BGP CTL show rip 8888, which is an address that should be visible everywhere. Um, yeah, we, we see the next hop given here, which is this router over here, and we see an AS path back here, which shows that the path to that destination here um, goes through 65537 here and 250 up here and then ends up in 15169, which is Google, by the way. And AS250, of course, has some connection to Google to do that. Okay, and now all of this uh, is only really useful if we have a second connection to the internet, 
Uh, it could be to anyone in this case. I didn't want to draw next another box, so it goes to AS250 here. And we get a full view here as well. Um, it goes to this router because obviously you want to have some redundancy, so you use two different machines. Um, and now you have to make a decision which route to take uh, to 8888. Um, either this way or that way. And uh, now we look at the routing table and we see uh, two prefixes because, yeah, we, we get that prefix from two, um, two different upstreams. And back here, you see the AS path length. And this is the one we've seen already. And this is the new one, which is lacking 65537 because it's coming directly there. And um, yeah, in the front here, you have this little um, larger sign. And that uh, shows that actually this route is chosen. So normally, the lower route would be chosen because it's a shorter path. But you, here you see the local pref has been increased by some rule I put in the rule set. And that's why this one is the better one of the two. OK, now, if one of these links goes down, um, we have the same information on the other link. And BGPD will uh, notice that the link isn't available and take out all the routes uh, and put in the alternatives. OK. Um, yeah, that's that decision, which route to choose, is called the route selection. Um, and when we made our route decision, we pass on all the routes to our internal BGP speakers. Uh, and sometimes, depending on our policy, to external peers. Um, now, we only forward the best routes we have, the best information we see. Um, and all the other, uh, the, the, the receiver of these routes also makes uh, the route decision and uh, does uh, run the route decision process. Um, so these steps that are taken to decide what route to use are uh, in the BGP standard. Uh, and because, uh, yeah, from time to time you need them, you will find them in BGPD8 in the man page. And in OpenBSD, we added one extra decision. Uh, we, we have a local weight attribute to do route decisions. Yeah, every, everyone has little knobs added to this decision process. And um, the whole point of this is that uh, the, the algorithm that runs there, the, the steps that are used, make sure that you usually uh, end up with, without any routing loops um, in your network. OK, now how do you uh, stick this all together? Um, you uh, have your internal network here with your, with your networks that need to be um, reachable. And you set up some connection to the outside. Now, in your internal network, you run OSPF. And it allows uh, everyone in your network to see everyone else. And uh, to the outside, you speak BGP. Um, now, if you announce one of these machines announces uh, a default route, or both of them, um, into OSPF, that would be enough to make this work. Because uh, now these routers here, uh, if they want to send anything to the outside world, they'll, um, they'll send it to one of these. And both of these have, um, have connectivity to the rest of the internet and will pass the traffic on either here or here. Um, that's not necessarily the best. Uh, way to do, to do things because now if traffic flows from here to router two and then to router one and then out here, um, that's one hop more than, than you need to have. Maybe you have a direct connection over here and the, it could go this way. So um, what you can do is you can run OSPF and BGPD on all of these machines. Um, and now these send traffic to the direct next hop. Um, this gets a bit silly when, when you uh, build a large network, because all of these BGP speakers have to talk to each other. So if you 
for, if you add one more here, you have to configure all, on all of the others your, uh, this, this new neighbor. It's a lot of work. So in OpenBSD, we support uh, something called route reflectors. Um, there are two ways to, to do this, to split your network into larger blocks in, in, in BGP. The other thing is called confederations, and we don't do that. Uh, we only have route reflectors. Um, and what these do is they split the network into two parts, the one that is connected uh, in a full mesh. All of these four talk to each other. And the other part, the route reflector clients, which only talk to the route reflectors. And what's happening there is that uh, this modifies a little bit the, um, the way the routes are propagated. It changes the algorithm a little bit so that um, these route reflect, uh, the, the, that this will work. So um, the route reflectors basically take over sending information between these two. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, with, with those, these few routers, you don't re see the gain immediately. Uh, but uh, if you think a little bit about it, if now you only have to, if you add one, one more router back here, you only have to configure the sessions on two machines. Uh, and in a typical bigger network, you will have route reflectors maybe in, in every location or something like that for redundancy. Okay. Um, some, some things that should, you should uh, look at when, when you use BGP. Um, make sure that you only announce what you're actually responsible for. If uh, someone here has listened to the earlier talk um, by Massimo, um, he mentioned that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, someone in Pakistan announced uh, the net blocks of YouTube. Uh, and, well, their upstream didn't filter those announcements, and uh, with the result that a lot of YouTube traffic went, uh, went to Pakistan, and of course, YouTube wasn't reachable there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that too, yeah. that too. Um, yeah, he had another example where someone in the Ukraine managed to hijack some routes that actually should have uh, gone to um, to the UK, and they did it in a way where the traffic wasn't dropped in the Ukraine. Instead, it went back on another path to the UK, and nobody actually noticed for quite some time. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, people should only announce what they're responsible for, and their upstreams uh, should uh, make sure that, that they only accept routes that belong there, so that accidents like that can't happen. Of course, it's, uh, this is uh, uh, a bit of a problem of scale. At some point, your rule set will get too big if you're further up in the hierarchy. Yes, exactly. Um, but still, there are ways to automate that. Um, there, are, uh, in, in, uh, there are databases that contain all the relationships between, um, between ASs, and from these relationships, you can bi automa automatically build those filter lists. Um, yeah, then there is another thing uh, that's uh, Best Current Practices 38, the document is called, uh, and it uh, talks about network ingress filtering. Uh, so um, you all heard about DDoS attacks, and uh, the way they work is uh, that, ad, uh, that, that um, traffic, uh, outbound traffic from some people is spoofed. So you send a packet with a spoofed uh, source address, and uh, send it to some destinations that reply with a uh, much bigger payload on the way back. But it doesn't come back to the sender, it comes back to the guy who had his address spoofed, uh, the uh, person who is attacked. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the reason why this is possible is because um, someone in the path isn't filtering the, um, the, the traffic that is coming from the person who's spoofing addresses. Uh, now, 
any network should know which addresses are used where in the network. And should, you should be able to uh, set filters um, on those paths and only allow the traffic in uh, that, that can theoretically come from there. Um, that's called a reverse path forwarding check. And in OpenBSD, in, in PF, we have uh, something that's called uh, the URPF failed check. Uh, which does that automatically for you if you put that, uh, use that feature in a rule. Um, sometimes that's a bit problematic if you have asymmetric traffic, uh, that might not always work. But uh, if you apply it on your network's edge as, as far downstream as possible to, your, uh, to, to where the addresses are used, that uh, should actually work and should help eliminate DDoS a little bit. Okay, so um, now in, in the networks, in the little diagrams I've shown, uh, the, the external BGP speakers, there were two of them, so they are redundant. If one of them isn't available, nothing bad will happen. The other path will be used. Um, nobody notices. Now, but the default gateways in front of those three little networks, they, uh, they are a problem, so um, you, want to have those default gateways redundant as well. In OpenBSD, we have CARP for that, the Common Address Redundancy Protocol, and with that, you can have two machines, two default gateways uh, in, in front of network, and they do failover between them. So one is master, one is backup. If one doesn't work, the other takes over, and you can take one down for maintenance, for upgrades, and don't have a downtime. And it works together with PF, uh, because the two are able to sync their PF states, so uh, no TCP sessions get lost when you have a failover. Um, and the, ni the nice thing about that is that uh, BGP and OSPFD know about CARP. So um, the, there are two ways this can work. In BGPD, the, um, the uh, uh, the session state um, of a BGP connection um, can be synced to the, to the CARP state. So what that means is if a machine is CARP master, the BGP session will be up. If you have a failover and uh, the machine uh, is in backup, uh, the BGP session will be torn down. Um, why is that useful? Because um, the backup machine, if it announces a network in BGP, uh, this announcement will go away because the BGP se uh, session goes away. And uh, the backup machine uh, doesn't get any more traffic. Um, so you, the traffic on the outside comes in on the master only. And uh, the other way this can work is that the session state of the BGP session influences the CARP demotion counter. And the CARP demotion counter is what um, trips the balance between the two. So the, high, uh, the machine with a higher demotion counter will be in backup state. Uh, if my BGP session goes down, um, the machine will become the backup machine. Uh, of course, you can't use both at the same time. Um, doesn't make sense. No, no, they don't do, uh, need that. Um, there, uh, there are reasons why, uh, why you want the IP in that subnet, but that's... Uh, that's not an no, no, that's not an option. No, the, the cases in where you want that is, for example, um, if you actually run services on these machines, uh, like, no, right, like RelayD, where, uh, where you have, uh, RelayD is our uh, load balancer daemon, uh, written by Reich originally. Uh, and that load balancer daemon, um, of course, needs to check the state of, an, uh, of machine spec uh, in that subnet. And it can, cannot do that if you're in backup mode. So then you want another address there on, on your, uh, below your CARP interface. Yes, that can work. Henning, are you using CARP in Hamburg on the IX? Yeah. yeah. Okay works. Um, yeah. 
The thing is, um, uh, CARP uses, yeah, of course, not only there. <laughs> CARP uses, uh, there are multiple modes in which you can configure it here. And one mode uses multicast, where it sends uh, traffic out. You usually don't want that at an internet exchange. So there's another mode where you can uh, specify, um, yeah, make, make, make them talk directly to each other without multicast. Yeah, so, using unicast Yeah, using unicast. Yeah. Yeah. But if you go to Unicast in the beginning, you're done. Of course, yeah. it's limited to to two nodes, but that's okay. That's okay in that case. But more than two nodes, only if you feel compressed to be happy with your algorithm. Yeah. I I implemented the Unicast mode for the default uh, for the yeah. I'm us using usually using multicast, but only because, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay. Um. But uh, let me add something. It's, it's a weird problem with, uh, sorry, I have to make it up again. With the virtual red dot and the cost of one, uh, virtual red switches that you render as one. Yeah. Don't allow to run um, virtual method calls. Yeah. Yeah. So CARP can do a lot more things. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a bit complex. Um, yeah. It is. Um, we have RIPD. Um, RIPD is also rather new, I think, uh, sometime in the last five years. And um, we have had, had, we had the old routed uh, daemon in, in base before. Uh, but uh, of course, all these routing daemons share a common, um, a common heritage, uh, and and all the source code looks. Um, if, if you if you've read the source code of one of those daemons, the others uh, you, you'll find your way through the others, and um, also that uh, they share um, they share features like pledge, uh, the, their privilege separated, etc. And the old routed didn't have that, uh, and so it was decided that um, it's a nice idea to have RIPD written uh, in the style of all the others. I almost want RIPD to phone home. There cannot be more than five users in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So EIGRP uh, is the newest uh, that we support. Um, it was added by Renato last, uh, last year. Um, and as I said earlier, um, yeah, it's uh, originally from Cisco, but they uh, published an RFC and this was standardized last year, I think. Or this year only? Well, they published, they published their documentation two, year, two or three years ago, actually, and then it took a while for the RFC to be uh, accepted as a standard. Um, we have something else called routed domain, routing domains. Um, uh, there, I think there were talks uh, about this last year or two years ago by Peter, uh, who did the work uh, on routing domains uh, uh, v doing v6. Um, and what it does, it uh, separates uh, the, your, your machine into sets of interfaces and routing tables. So you have different routing tables uh, with different content, and uh, with that you can, yeah, basically do some fancy tricks. A simple use case is have one interface in a management network, and it's totally separate from all the other routing tables, from, from your main routing table. So the machine will be still reachable over the management network if BGPD crashes, which it shouldn't do, <laughs> or uh, something else bad happens, if you make a configuration mistake, for example. Okay, uh, if you run all of that stuff, uh, you want to do some traffic analysis, maybe. Um, we uh, have pflow, um, our NetFlow implementation, and you can send uh, NetFlow uh, statist uh, data, your, your flows, to a NetFlow collector and get some fancy statistics there. Um, and in ports, of course, we have a few tools uh, to help along with that. 
Um, if you monitor, you have to monitor what you're running, obviously, because uh, otherwise you don't notice that it's not working. Um, for that, uh, we have SNMPD. Um, so yeah, you can use your usual SNMP tools on, on that. And um, in ports, you'll find uh, Smokeping, for example, and a few, all, the, all the usual tools, actually. Um, OK, uh, a good idea is to, to do uh, central logging if you have a bigger network, and then analyze what's happening uh, if you uh, see some, some problems in your network, for example, or see your BG, the, the, the state of your BGP peers. If, if one is going up and down all the time, there might be a problem, et cetera. You want to find out these things before, before some users complain, usually. Um, yeah, performance uh, of OpenBSD. Um, yeah, some, some people here have done performance measurements <laughs> uh, in the past. Um, at the moment, uh, I would say uh, with, with 10G cards, you can safely run up to, yeah, what did we see, 500,000 500, packets per second? Yeah, it's, it's become better. That was last year since, yeah? Yeah, I know. That's what I'm going to say. And that was last year before we started the work on um, improving our network stack and getting rid of the big lock. And um, yes, that has pushed it up to uh, 1.2 million packets per second. Um, so, uh, but of course, uh, if you do this, you should test for yourself uh, what, what your limits are and where you can use it. Um, also, if you do this, uh, you should think about an upgrade path. So if, if your traffic grows and grows, uh, of course, at some point, you, uh, you might no longer um, be able to use OpenBSD in a certain role. So uh, yeah, general software router. So uh, you have to think about what to do then and uh, what your upgrade path is. Um, another thing, automation. Um, if you're already using things like Puppet and Ansible, a uh, good thing, then you can also run your um, run that on OpenBSD and configure everything there. Um, yeah, and uh, a safety net. Uh, if if you do this and you um, and it doesn't work, then uh, and you do this in a professional environment, then it's kind of a sad thing. So make sure that it works. <laughs> Um, document everything so if you're not available other people can uh, can find out what you did and use it and <laughs> uh, yeah obviously uh, every everyone should uh, have some test lab to try things out before putting them in production um, as I already said make sure you have a strategy planned uh, for for upgrading everything um, and make sure you know uh, where, where to ask for help. Um, tell, tell your boss what the limits are of what you're building there. Don't uh, make promises <laughs> uh, that uh, may, may not uh, be easy to fulfill. Um, and yeah, uh, make sure you're not the only one who knows what you're building there. Because then, in the end, uh, you might not be there. and. It will, uh, it will not work. And yeah, be present in the community and stay current about developments uh, in OpenBSD as well uh, as uh, in, on the internet in general. Um, yeah? I'm willing to pay somebody to fix OpenBSD on FreeBSD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, one thing uh, that's not on the slide. Uh, you can ask for professional help. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peter? <laughs> maybe, maybe with enough beer, someone turns up and, uh, say, and, uh, and updates the portable version of it. I don't know. 
Okay, that said, uh, there are a few other um, open source implementation of uh, routing daemons. So um, these these also exist as ports on OpenBSD, but they are not as integrated with the network stat as the base daemons are. So these have a kind of different role uh, if you use them in your network. Like BIRD, for example, is heavily used uh, by internet exchanges, um, which have different needs uh, on what the, uh, what the BGP there has to do. And Quagga is a very old uh, source base, uh, but it's still being maintained. And yeah. Uh, Quagga was the reason I started here. Exactly. <laughs> I wanted to say that. There are also a few other newer uh, BGP implementations that are mostly useful for debugging or, for example, for uh, just announcing something, not receiving routes. Yeah, XRBGP, for example. Okay, uh, that's it, and thanks uh, for listening. Thanks uh, to uh, BSDCAN, and 